okay? So today we're looking at the eukaryotic cell cycle and processes for which our bodies generate new cells, all right? We can look at two processes, mitosis and meiosis, and establish um, the importance of these processes and what the outcomes are, all right? Um, so just a little background, we, we talked a little bit about the cell theory already, but we do know uh, that the cell is the most basic unit of life. And then one of the postulates of the cell theory tells us that um, new cells arise from pre-existing cells, right? And so the background for what we're looking at today is that these uh, pre-existing cells will go on through cellular division to form new cells. All right. And the production or creation of these new cells are necessary in order for an organism to continue to grow, repair tissue damage, reproduce. OK, so reproduction, we establish again, that's one of our requirements for life. So anyway, the generation of these new cells are absolutely essential for an organism to continue existing. Right. All, our, all of our cells in our bodies do not have an infinite lifespan. Right. So if I asked for you to describe or discuss your understanding for the need for cellular division, you would uh, respond understanding that in order for an organism to continue and grow and develop throughout its lifetime, in order to repair damage in an organism tissue, you know, we're made, uh, our bodies are made from uh, cells and tissues and so forth. And so the regeneration of these cells help with um, repairing damage that just occurs over time. And then obviously uh, reproduction. We know that in order to uh, continue to perpetuate a species, we need to uh, reproduce, all right? So these new cells that are produced during meiosis are necessary for sexual reproduction. So, so this conversation can be quite extensive for, uh, uh, for you demonstrating your understanding of why cellular, vis cellular division is necessary, right? And so we're clear, I'm sorry, I have my door open, trying to get some air. Um, cells contain genetic information in the form of DNA, right? We know that our DNA is contained in the nucleus of the cell. And so what's happening is that when a cell divides, right? When we create a new daughter cell, the cell has to go through a process in which it it duplicates or replicates the genetic material that it already has, right? So that it can transmit or pass a set of genetic information over to that daughter cell, right? So that's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at these series of steps that are involved in a cell preparing to go from one cell and being divided into two cells. Okay, so we use those terms parent cell and daughter cell. You might hear me mention daughter cells a lot. The parent cell is the original cell that we start with. And then through a series of steps, that parent cell will go undergo some changes and in, in, in adjustments, if you will, in preparation for being divided into two new cells, right? And one of the main things that it's doing is duplicating its genetic material, right? That's what's going to happen in the eukaryotic cell cycle, all right? In this process of mitosis, we're going to generate a um, identical copy of the parent cell, okay? So in essence, when a cell divides, the information in the DNA must be accurately replicated and copies will be transmitted to the daughter cell through a series of steps, all right? And so again, just a little bit more background information. We know that the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell is where um, the DNA can be found. Um, uh, the genetic material, which is DNA, is packaged in the form of chromosomes, right? So write down this term chromosomes, right? You may have heard me use this term um, before now, but we're establishing now like what these chromosomes are, right? When we're looking at the genetic material in, a, in the human, for example, we know that our somatic cells have a certain number of chromosomes. All normal humans are going to have a certain number of chromosomes, Right, and this chromosome is basically sort of like this packaged DNA that's um, wrapped around protein to form these chromosomes. Right, so today we want to quickly run through the steps of uh, mitosis and meiosis, which are uh, two 
uh, processes for the generation of, of cells in our bodies, all right? Um, from mitosis, there are, there's a series of steps in which the parent cell transmits genetic information to the daughter cell, okay? So jot this down real quick. The results of mitosis are going to generate identical cells, so it's almost like cloning, okay? During mitosis, you make an exact copy or replica of the cell that you start with. Okay, that's mitosis. Meiosis is a little bit different. Okay, this is a reductive cell division that ends up um, creating um, four daughter cells that are going to be uh, genetically different. All right, so the sole purpose of meiosis is to produce gametes or sex cells. Okay. So there's a series of steps in which the uh, chromosomes will be adjusted and reduced in preparation for sexual reproduction, all right? So it is very important that you can distinguish between the necessity or the, or the goal of these two processes, right? The goal of mitosis is to generate new body cells, okay? We call those body cells uh, somatic cells, right? These are all of the cells in our bodies apart from our sex cells, all right? Now our bodies are made up of several different thousand types of cells. They all have various purpose, purposes in us, uh, existing, developing, growing, you know, all of the above, different tissues being formed. So mitosis is gonna regenerate those types of cells, okay? Meiosis is exclusively responsible for producing sex cells. Okay, so that's where our gametes are made, the um, sperm cells and egg cells, okay? All right, so that's just a little background information. So again, I use that term chromosome, okay? Chromosomes are the major, the major carrier of genetic information, right? And these chromosomes are found in the nucleus of the cell and they contain these chromatin fibers, again, which are just sort of these mixtures of uh, DNA and proteins, right? And so again, I, I mentioned the, the, the process, this um, cell cycle having to be done with uh, accuracy and fidelity, okay? That's absolutely essential because again, these chromosomes contains genetic information that dictates how we exist, right? Um, our genes on these chromosomes dictate the features and uh, characteristics about us, like our hair color and eye color and, you know, how we function from a physical standpoint and from a physiological standpoint. So it is very important that these chromosomes are, 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 are duplicated and uh, transmitted to the daughter cells with accuracy. And so for the human, each human cell, okay, our somatic cells are going to have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Write that down, okay? Each human cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes, okay? So if there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, how many total chromosomes do we have in our somatic cells? 46. 46, that is absolutely correct, all right? And so those two, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes are a result of you inheriting one set of um, chromosomes from your mom and one set of chromosomes from dad, okay? And so each of those chromosomes contain very important uh, instructions, okay, for us to uh, exist, all right? And so right here, what you see in this picture is called a human karyotype. Write that down, karyotype. K-A-R-Y-O-T-Y-P-E, karyotype. And so the human karyotype shows us a layout of all of the human chromosomes, right? Our chromosomes are identified by either numbers or letters, right? Specifically our um, somatic chromosomes, okay, are going to be identified by a number, numbers 1 through 22, okay? All of the um, genes on these chromosomes are going to have information in the form of our somatic cells, all right? 
this last pair of chromosomes we see here are indicated by a letter. These are our sex chromosomes, okay? These sex chromosomes are gonna be either XX in the pair or XY, all right? So this human karyotype, we can right away look for um, some basic information in terms of um, abnormalities. Okay, we can determine the sex of an individual by looking at this chromosomal uh, karyotype. What sex is this individual right here? Does anyone know? Does anyone know the sex of this person, this individual? Female? A what? A girl. Yes, this is a female. How did you determine that? The chromosome XX. Yes, so we have a sex chromosome pair XX right here, and this tells us that this is a female, okay? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But this, this human karyotype, we, um, again, can identify our chromosomes based on um, numbers 1 through 22. And each normal human, there are, they're going to exist in pairs, all right? And so there has been, you know, quite a lot of research to the Human Genome Project. You can write that down if you care to go out and just kind of read about it a little bit. But the Human Genome Project was a major undertaking that took several years for us to uh, map the human genome, right? So we now know all of the um, genes that exist in the humans and what their functions are, right? And so on this human karyotype, we now know which chromosomes are responsible for which features that we see in a human, all right? So eye color, hair color, skin color, we know like what chromosomes these genes can be found on, okay? And then we also know now which chromosomes are responsible for um, genetic abnormalities and genetic related syndromes and diseases and cancers and things like that that are genetic based, okay? Um, I'm thinking about a uh, Down syndrome. You guys have probably heard about Down syndrome before. That is a genetic abnormality due to um, inheriting an extra chromosome number 21, right? So in the case of these chromosomes and these pairings, um, we want to be at 23 pairs. And so too many chromosomes and too few chromosomes can lead to um, genetic abnormalities in an individual. Okay. And so people with uh, Down syndrome actually have a third chromosome number 21. They call it a trisomy, if you want to look that up. Trisomy, meaning three. So we know if we looked at a human karyotype and we saw an extra chromosomal uh, chromosome for uh, chromosome number 21, we know this person is going to physically present with uh, Down syndrome. Right. And so there are a number of other um, syndromes and illnesses that are genetic in nature that we can um, pinpoint uh, from a genetic standpoint, nor which chromosomes are affected and which genes are coded on which chromosomes. I'm not a geneticist, so I can't run off too many of them, but I, know, I don't know why Down syndrome sticks off in my head. But I know there are a few others that uh, we can um, accurately identify in terms of their uh, chromosome abnormality. All right. So the point we're making here is that when we're generating these um, new cells, the genetic information needs to be copy, uh, copied uh, accurately, right? And that's because these genes, right, that are in our DNA are responsible for us functioning and existing, right? And so DNA is organized into genes, all right? I know I've been using these terms all semester, but I want you to understand here what is a gene, all right? A gene is nothing more than a sequence of DNA that's coding for a particular product, okay? In this case, we're talking about proteins, right? We know that proteins are the functional units of cells, right? So we heavily rely on our genes, right? And we refer to them as informational units, right? So these are just segments of DNA, okay? Sequences of DNA that code for a particular product, Okay, so genes are considered to be informational units that provide information to carry out specific cell functions, all right? And so we're alluding to the production of these proteins, all right? So humans, we have over 20,000 genes in our bodies that code for proteins, right? And it is these proteins that, again, give our cells their various functions, 
right? So any organism can have thousands of genes, right? All of these genes are going to code for various um, protein products, okay? And so, you know, I'm just speaking in the context of the human now that we have genes that are going to govern uh, various factors about us, right? Such as our eye color, all right, in the human, all right, on the fly, like flies have different wing lengths, okay, the width or length of the fly wing, that's determined genetically, okay, that's a physical feature that is genetically determined, okay, um, the seed color of the peas or pea plants, okay, that's going to be determined genetically, okay, different genes are going to dictate the, uh, the color of those pea plants, all right, so we're we're establishing this this point here that our DNA is organized into informational units known as genes. Okay, and in the human, we have over twenty thousand genes that are um, dispersed throughout those twenty three pairs of chromosomes. Right, and those genes are going to dictate various features about us and we call it the phenotype the things that we can see from a physical standpoint but they also can um control uh, physiological features that things that you can't necessarily see physically all right so there are some uh i i'm pretty sure there are some genetic uh relations with um abnormalities like mental retardation i think or schizophrenia i think some of those are sort of genetic based okay they're encoded in your dna okay so those are things that you can't see but our dna is responsible for our dna is organized into genes and these genes code for functional protein products right and so all of those genes are dispersed into one of those 23 pairs of chromosomes okay so the dna in the nucleus is packaged into these structures that we call chromosomes, right? You've probably seen this structure of the chromosome before where we have these two sister chromatids um, adjoining with the centromere in the middle, all right? So these chromatin are basically um, DNA wrapped around proteins. So we have this DNA protein assembly here, okay? Um, Chromosomes can differ amongst species, right? So we've talked about the diversity of life a little bit. We know that there are many, many different types of organisms or species of organisms that exist, okay? Every species is gonna have a specific number of chromosomes in their cells, right? So for example, the human, as I said before, we have 46 chromosomes in our somatic cells. That number does not change in normal humans, okay? Now there are uh, deviations from the norm and that's where we end up with um, things like genetic abnormalities, okay? But in a normal human, we're gonna have 46 chromosomes in our somatic cells. Other species are gonna have different numbers of chromosomes. So I do want you to understand that, that a dog and a rabbit and a fish and a turtle may all have different numbers of chromosomes, okay? in their genome, okay? Um, and then I also want you to understand that the information contained in chromosomes can differ amongst species, okay? So remember I said, I showed you in that human karyotype that our chromosomes are aligned in number from chromosomes one through 22, those um, somatic chromosomes. And then we had that one pair of sex chromosomes. And so for the human, okay, thanks to the Human Genome Project, we know which genes are found on which chromosomes, okay? So which information is on each of those chromosomes? Well, that information could be different amongst different species, okay? So we'll just say hypothetically that the gene that encodes eye color in humans is gonna be found on chromosome number four. I don't know if that's true. In fact, now that I think about it, I think that there are multiple genes that influence eye color and maybe not just one, but we'll just say hypothetically that the gene that encodes eye color in the human is found on chromosome number four, okay? That may not be the same for a rabbit, okay? The gene that controls eye color in a rabbit 
maybe chromosome number 12. Okay, so we're saying here that different species are going to have um, a different number of chromosomes. Okay, and the information contained in each of those chromosomes can be different from species to species. What questions do we have right now? Awesome. So that was a whole lot of background information. Now let's look at the mechanism. How does, how does this happen? Okay, we're gonna look at the eukaryotic cell cycle. Okay, so two things I want you to walk away with today, being able to identify the stages of the cell cycle, okay? And then describing what's happening at each uh, event of the cell cycle, all right? And so I've already kind of made the point that when cells, uh, that our cells don't have an infinite lifespan per se, they either um, divide into a new cell or they die, right? So when cells reach a certain size, age, they usually either stop growing or they divide, okay? Not all cells will divide. Some of them will die, okay? And so the stages for which a cell goes from one cell division, okay, to the next is called a cell cycle, okay? The cell cycle takes anywhere from eight to 20 hours, depending on the organism. So in plants and animal cells, this process of going from one cell and completing one entire cycle can take anywhere from eight hours to 20 hours, okay? Um, I lost my thought. The cell can take anywhere from Yes, eight to 20 hours or so, depending on the organism, okay? So this is the cell cycle, all right? You've probably seen this schematic before, okay? The cell cycle consists of two main phases, okay? Jot these down if you need to. I think you should, okay? Two main phases of the cell cycle, interphase and emphase, okay? Generally speaking, uh, two things are happening. The cell is preparing for division and then the cell actually divides, okay? Interphase is that preparation period, okay? There are three stages of interphase, okay? And so all of the things that are happening in preparation for the cell to split off into two new cells, all of those prep phases happen in interphase, okay? Interphase is characterized by G1, gap phase one. So this whole piece of the pie right here is interphase, okay? So we've got G1, we've got S phase synthesis, and then we've got G2, this is gap phase two, okay? These three stages, G1, S, and G2, collectively make up interphase. Jot that down. Okay. All right. So interphase is the preparation period. Okay. Then the cell goes into M phase. Okay. This little piece right here is M phase. All right. It doesn't take a lot of time for this phase to complete. Okay. The cell spends most of its time in interphase preparing for preparation or uh, preparing for a cell division. So during M phase, a process known as mitosis takes place, right? And this is where we see the physical uh, 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 manipulations of these chromosomes, okay? In preparation for this process known as cytokinesis where that cytoplasm actually splits off into two new cells, okay? So again, we got G1, gap phase one, which is a period of kind of growth and you know normal growth of metabolism that the cell goes through. It's, it's quite uh, normal here. 
the cell spends quite a lot of time here in G1, just kind of preparing, synthesizing enzymes and so forth, preparing for uh, to enter S phase. Okay, S phase is a, a period of synthesis. Okay, synthesis means you know to create something. So something's being created here. This is where our DNA is being duplicated. Right. Remember, we said the goal of mitosis was to generate a new copy of the cell. Well, in order to do that, we've got to duplicate what's already present. All right. In the human, that's going to be 46 chromosomes. All right. The DNA that's in the human somatic cell is 46 chromosomes. So that number actually has to duplicate right here during S phase. Right. Then we go on over to gap phase two, where again, it's just kind of another um, short checkpoint to make sure that things have happened the way that they should and that the cell should continue over into um, mitosis. All right. And let's see here. Yeah. So let's walk through these a little bit more. All right. So interphase. I said interphase was sort of the preparation period. All right. This, most of the cell's uh, life is spent in interphase. Okay. One of the most important things to note here is that there's no cellular division taking place during interphase, okay? The cell is not going to divide as long as it's still in interphase. But what is happening during interphase is that the cell is growing. It's synthesizing the needed uh, materials, et cetera, that is gonna um, be necessary uh, for division, okay? Again, the steps of interphase include G1, S and G2. These collectively make up interphase. All right. G1 is what we call gap phase one. Okay. This is an interval period where no DNA synthesis is occurring. Okay. The only thing that's happening here is just normal growth and metabolism. Okay. The cell is just it's just growing, going through its normal uh, metabolic activity, obtaining the nutrients that it needs. Um, this is typically the longest phase of the cell cycle. Okay, growth, metabolism, getting all the things that it needs to uh, enter synthesis. All right, so that's going to include uh, enzyme synthesis. All right, we've got to prepare um, the enzymes that are required or DNA synthesis. These enzymes are gonna now become a little bit active um, as the cell prepares to enter S phase, okay? It is important that you annotate here that during gap phase one, obviously there's no cell division going on because this is still a part of interphase, but there's no synthesis happening here. No DNA synthesis is occurring at G1, okay? Synthesis doesn't start until we get over to uh, S phase, okay? So S phase is the point in the cell cycle where DNA is replicated or duplicated, okay? This is a very important uh, process because the end goal here is for us to make, to end up with two new cells. So this parent cell that we start with will be split into two daughter cells, all right? So we've got to duplicate the genetic material here so that this uh, newly generated daughter cell has the exact copies of chromosomes that this parent started with, okay? Once the duplication of that genetic material is complete, the cell will enter another gap phase, okay? That is gap phase two, okay? This is where, again, it's, it's the cell is kind of making its last ditch effort to make sure everything has happened the way that it should and determining whether or not this cell should be signaled for death, okay? or if it should continue over into uh, M phase for mitosis and cytokinesis, okay? So this gap phase two is a relatively short phase, right? Because everything that needs to happen for the most part has now happened, all right? So now the cell is preparing for division, okay? Finally, the cell now is out of interphase and it has moved into M phase, okay? M phase, M phase involves two main processes, okay? Mitosis and cytokinesis, okay? Mitosis, again, is the process where we sort of have this nuclear activity where our chromosomes are beginning to be adjusted, okay? Um, and uh, uh, 
distributed into opposite ends of the cell in order for uh, cytokinesis to take place. All right, cytokinesis is the process by which this cytoplasm actually divides or splits in half to form two new cells. Okay, so I know this is a lot of information, but just walk with me. We're in M phase. The cell has gone through all of its preparation in interphase, where you know growth, metabolism, synthesis of enzymes, DNA replication, all of those things have happened. Now the cell is ready to um, divide. All right. So mitosis and cytokinesis. All right. So real quick for those of us that are visual. All right. This is just a different representation of what's happening during the eukaryotic cell cycle. As you're out studying and looking at different literature in your textbook and online, you're going to see various representations of this process. All right. So this one shows us that we have interphase. Right. Interphase is characterized by G1. S and G2, right? These all three collectively make up interphase, the period of preparation, okay? The cell is spending most of its time over here in G1, all right? S phase is synthesis, DNA is being replicated. G2 is a shorter gap phase that prepares for division. Once we're over in M phase, there are a series of steps that need to happen, all right? for these chromosomes to um, align into their proper orientation for cellular division. So let's see what happens during mitosis. Write this down. There are five stages of mitosis, okay? The acronym that can help you remember it is PMAT, okay? The five stages of mitosis, PMAT and then cytokinesis. So prophase, write these down real quick and we'll talk about them process of mitosis occurs over five stages. We've got prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then finally cytokinesis. All right. Very, very quickly, uh, you know, the condensed version of what's happening here is that during prophase, these chromosomes start to uh, condense and become more compact and become visible. Okay, we start to see these uh, chromosomes visibly condense and compact into uh, uh, visible chromosomes. And I do have some um, pictures in the coming slides here. Okay, so during prophase, our chromosomes are condensing and compacting and shortening and becoming visible. During metaphase, these chromosomes are going to align towards the center of the cell. All right, so this is a very distinct motion and movement or alignment of our chromosomes where they're aligning towards the center of the cell, okay? During anaphase, these sister chromatids are gonna start to separate, right? And this makes sense, right? Because the end goal here is that we're gonna end up with two new cells being created. So these sister chromatids are gonna separate during anaphase and then during telophase, they're going to start to sort of move or migrate towards opposite ends of this cell. The cell is going to sort of take on this elongated shape that is going to allow for it to, to be split in half, right? So if you would just envision the cell is sort of elongating, right? And at each end of the uh, cell, you're going to have two distinct sets of chromosomes, and you're going to start to see these nuclear envelopes form around these two new sets of chromosomes, okay? This is our indication now that we're ready for uh, cytoplasmic division, cytokinesis, all right? Once we have completed telophase, we've got these chromosomes in two uh, distinct sets, right, on opposite ends of the poles, and now the cell is ready for cytokinesis to take place, which is basically when the cytoplasm will split in half down the middle and we will have two new cells being generated, okay? And so this is just another visual in our prophase. Um, we start to see these chromosomes um, condense and become visible during prophase, right? And prometaphase. And metaphase, we can clearly see the alignment of these chromosomes towards the mid plate, towards the middle of the cell. Okay, I remember what's happening with metaphase with the M, meta meaning middle. 
right? So these chromosomes are visibly aligning towards the center or middle of the cell during metaphase, right? Bearing in mind, you can see many, many different uh, iterations of this on different pictures, but these schematics should all kind of look the same. In a phase, we now see these sister chromatids start to separate and start to move in opposite directions, right? With the with the, with the end goal here of, of telophase showing us two uh, distinct sets of chromosomes, right? And you start to see these nuclear envelopes forming around each one of these, right? The cell has kind of taken on this elongated shape. And what you start seeing here is that there is some indentions that will start forming in this membrane, right? And we call this a cleavage furrow right here, right? We see these indentions present, which is basically meaning the cell is getting ready to divide, all right? The process of cytokinesis is when the cell divides into two distinct cells. Okay. This is just another uh, schematic. As I said before, many different sources and textbooks will give you um, various illustrations of what's happening, but we all see the same thing that these chromosomes begin to um, become visible in our prophase. Metaphase, we start to see these chromosomes align towards the middle. Early in anaphase, these uh, sister chromatids began to separate and move towards opposite ends of the cell, all right? In telophase, we have complete uh, separation of these sister chromatid sets, and we have these nuclear envelopes starting to form around our um, chromatin, and uh, mitosis is done, all right? When cytokinesis occurs, we have the creation of this cleavage furrow here, which is where the cytoplasmic division will take place. And we have the production of these two new daughter cells, okay? The end result of mitosis here, okay? Somatic, we're still talking about somatic cell division here, not sex cells, only somatic cells. The end result of mitosis, put this in your notes, okay? This is just another schematic showing you the same thing, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. The end result of mitosis is two daughter cells, each containing an exact copy, okay? In our case, 46 chromosomes, an exact copy of the parent cell. Mitotic cell division results in the production of two daughter cells that are exact replicas of the parent cell that we started with. We can stop right here today. I know this is a lot of information.